Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Game On, exclusive to Calkine TV. I'm James Preston and in this episode, the AFL mandates vaccinations, Brett Phillips talks tennis and Adam Santorossa takes us through the beautiful game. But let's begin with sports news. In cricket, Australia's Ashes campaign is reeling from the shock retirement of pace bowler James Pattinson. Pattinson has retired from Test cricket specifically and has requested selectors not to pick him for the upcoming series against England. With the first Test just seven weeks away, Pattinson has been battling a knee injury and is of the belief he would have insufficient preparation time as a result. Injuries have unfortunately been a huge part of Pattinson's career, limiting the exceptional quick to just 21 Test matches since entering the arena back in 2010. It's believed Pattinson will still make himself available for both one-day matches and T20s. In Rugby League, Supercoach Wayne Bennett has officially been announced as the inaugural coach of the NRL's new franchise, the Dolphins. 71-year-old Wayne Bennett has signed a four-year deal with the Dolphins beginning in 2023. Bennett holds the record for the most premiership victories as a coach with seven to his name. Still with the NRL, and there's a host of player movements that have occurred, Silva Havili has joined South Sydney from the Canberra Raiders. Mitch Rain will play for the Eels in 2022 after leaving the Titans. And for the West Tigers, contract talks have stalled with two players. The Tigers have been attempting to secure a transfer of former Raiders captain Josh Hodgson, but the deal is on pause due to fellow Raiders player Tom Starling being arrested by police for a second time. Negotiations with current Tigers star, second rower Luciano Leilua, have also stalled with Leilua pushing for an upgraded contract and the Tigers bulking at his $700,000 a season asking price. Undoubtedly, the biggest sporting story for this week comes from the AFL. The Football Code has made the extraordinary decision to introduce a no-jab, no-play edict for the 2022 season. AFL players and staff will now not be permitted to take part in the 2022 season unless they are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Victorian-based players and staff will need to have both doses of the vaccine by November 26, a date set for all authorised workers by the Victorian Government. Players and staff in New South Wales will need to be fully dosed by December 17 in advance of expected practice matches and the AFLW season start in January 2022. All remaining AFL players and staff in WA, SA and Queensland will need to be fully immunised by February 18 before likely scheduled practice matches in late February and the start of the season in March. Now, ignoring the ethical issues around mandatory vaccinations, let's just follow the letter of the law. For the best part of two years, citizens, companies and sporting codes have been following the guidance of government. That's important for a number of reasons. First and foremost, if we look at New South Wales, the requirement of double vaccination to partake in civil society is set to end on December 1. On December 1, COVID passes will no longer be required or checked for that matter, effectively providing the same freedoms to unvaccinated individuals. There are, of course, two AFL clubs that call New South Wales home, the Sydney Swans and the GWS Giants. Now, the AFL's edict provides that New South Wales-based players and staff must become fully vaccinated by December 18, 17 days after the New South Wales government, who has issued all health advice in the state to date, has instructed that such a requirement is no longer necessary. Now, the other reason why it's important that we understand government has been the thought leader in the battle of COVID surrounds vaccine-related injuries and deaths. The federal government, as you may be aware, has provided for zero liability to any of the vaccine manufacturers. If you die, so be it. You're one of the rare side effect sufferers. Oh, but don't worry, the government is here to help. $5,000 for a serious adverse reaction and $20,000 in the event of death. $20,000. That's what the life of someone like you and I is worth as part of the government's no-fault claim vaccine policy. But I guess we're just one of the plebs. We aren't high-profile athletes. So there's no fault there, but will there be no fault for the AFL? For fit and healthy athletes falling in the age brackets of 18 to 40 years of age. They're not obese. They're not elderly. Statistically, they're not much of a chance of having any serious issues arising from the virus itself. You know, the other thing about AFL players, they're the product of the competition. They're the product for broadcasts, and they earn a lot of money. 
the minimum wage for an AFL player is $110,000. And there are a number of players earning in excess of a million dollars a season. The federal government hasn't mandated vaccinations for players. The New South Wales government doesn't require proof of vaccination after December. Dan Andrews is a despot. So let's ignore anything that comes out of his mouth. And as for the other states, well, things are largely still up in the air. But again, governments aren't actually enforcing this. And they're willing to cough up 20k should you cough up a lung off the back of a vaccine. How much is the AFL willing to cough up? How much if, God forbid, Buddy Franklin and his $1.5 million contract suffered myocarditis from the Pfizer shot or a blood clot from AstraZeneca and instead of kicking a goal, he kicks the bucket? How much will the AFL pay? It's their product. It's their mandate. How much is it worth to them if something happens to a star or even just a staffer? With COVID vaccines, we have been presented the concept of choice and consequences based on those choices. If you're for the vaccine or against it, that's fine. I'm not passing any judgment. But the AFL is choosing to enforce this mandate. Consequences could and should follow in the event that any of their players, their product gets damaged. I hope to hell the payout is more than $20,000. And you can guarantee if there are any issues, you'll see a lawsuit the size of which only Pfizer is familiar with. Welcome back to K Game On, exclusive to Calkine TV. Time now to talk tennis with Brett Phillips. Well, Brett Phillips, great to have you on Game On once again. Oh, thank you, James. Nice to be here. Now, there is always tennis floating around the globe. It is, of course, a sport that never stops. What are the main competitions that we're having a look at at the moment, and do we have any Aussies competing in them? Yeah, certainly there are still some Aussies uh, on the road. A few have uh, come home and doing their quarantining and uh, basically uh, downing tools for the year. But yeah, look, obviously there's quite a few ATP, WTA events still going, certainly from an ATP and WTA perspective. Moscow is the focus. Uh, this week, the Kremlin Cup, which is always uh, an annual event, uh, played uh, indoors. Uh, they put on a really good show over there. Look, I love Tom Yanovich. He's had a, a terrific year. Uh, James, as we know, with her run at Wimbledon, her run at the US Open. Uh, she's uh, really um, you know, boosted her credentials in uh, women's tennis. Uh, actually took on uh, the number one seed this week, Arena Sabalenka, who we know uh, missed Indian Wells recently, uh, contracting COVID only a couple of days before. Look, she really pushed uh, Sabalenka, went to three, encouraging for Isla, who in about three weeks' time is going to lead our what was called the Fed Cup, now called the Billie Jean King Cup team in Ash Barty's um, absence. So she'll lead that team and she's got some really good form behind her and yeah, great job to push uh, certainly uh, Sabalenka. John Millman on the men's side is still alive. So he plays in a in a, in a quarter final. So Johnny, um, history says at the back end of any tennis season when he's just maybe the points out there and the rankings not where he'd like it to be, he does a very, very good recovery job to get himself back up uh, around the mark. So huge opportunity for him this week, uh, still alive in uh, that tournament. We've got a few other sort of lower level tournaments going on. There's lots of Australians who are trying to improve their ranking right around the globe. There's one guy, I don't know if we've ever mentioned him in our little segment here, but his name is Lee Two. And Lee Two is 25 from South Australia, started as a a young man on the tour at 18, 19. It wasn't quite right for him. He came back to Adelaide, where he still played a bit domestically, set up his own coaching business. When all the UTRs were going on uh, last year when the Australians couldn't travel, he dominated. Got a wild card into the Australian Open this year on the back of no ATP ranking. He actually played the world number 12, Feliciano Lopez who's been a great player, world number 12 uh, back many years ago. He's nearly 40 now, Feliciano, but still a very good player. Took him to four sets. Then he stayed home. Then he's gone back on right to the lower levels of the tour to get a ranking. And uh, he's something like 34 wins, three losses in the last uh, six weeks. So keep an eye on Lee too. He's going to do some damage. I like that. He's uh, coming under the radar, so to speak. But mm. one player that certainly isn't, he's been making headlines just about everywhere you turn, whether it's in uh, the sporting world, the political world, or even the medical world, as it would now be. That's Novak Djokovic. Now, there's a lot at play here. Break it down for us. What's the latest? Well, I mean, 
Melbourne has been his best slam. I mean, he's going for a 10th Australian Open. He's going for 21 majors to uh, get past Federer mm. and Nadal with that last stumble at the US Open. He loves Melbourne. This has been his, his home. This is where he's absolutely excelled on Rod Laver Arena. Now, in an interview on Serbian uh, television, I think it was uh, this week, he isn't prepared to declare whether he has been vaccinated or not. He thinks it's an intrusion of his privacy, that he shouldn't be asked that question. Uh, we assume, because he has sort of publicly in the past said, I'm not really in favour of vaccinations. He has had COVID, of course. He and his wife have had COVID. Uh, we assume that he's not vaccinated, but we don't know officially. And I know his management is in um, really you know, big talks with Tennis Australia to try and resolve this. But at the end of the day, it's out of Tennis Australia's hands. It's in the federal government's hands who will say, if you want a visa into Australia, it looks like you're going to have to be uh, doubly jabbed. Although that's still a little murky. And uh, yes, there's been some political figures that have come out and said, including our Premier here in Victoria, that you're probably not going to get in unless you've been jabbed, but nothing's official in terms of being uh, documented and the, the I's dotted and T's crossed on this one. So I'm not so, I'm not suggesting there would be a special exemption for Djokovic, uh, but is there going to be some uh, possibility of any international uh, people coming into Australia who are unvaccinated? I think we seem to think that's unlikely, but it still does need to be cleared up. So. Well, let's see what happens, but a lot of lot of talks going on behind the scenes. Well, that's the thing as well, because if Djokovic is allowed in, that will set a precedent. And I yeah. know he's the number one player in the world, but once you've had that, anybody competing or at least attempting to gain entry into the Australian Open has to be given the same treatment. It's as simple as that. The other thing yeah. I think is really interesting, Brett, is it comes down to, I suppose, the conviction that Djokovic has. Is that strong enough to defeat his desire to be that all-time greatest Grand Slam winner in terms of the 21, because that's what it comes down to. I mean, you can look at the ethical side of things in whether he should have to disclose it or not, but for him personally, yeah. it's a conviction issue. No doubt. Yeah. I, and look, this is it, it, there's so much writing on this for him in terms of his uh, in terms of his career. So we have a major here. It's a huge carrot. If, if the Australian Open was just a, a lower level event, there's plenty of players that would skip uh, not playing the Australian Open. But no one not doesn't want to be here. The prize money, the points, the prestige, it's a launching pad. You even come here and win a round or two, it sets up your year financially. So no one wants to miss Australia. We saw what the players went through last year uh, doing uh, quarantine like no other place in the world. That's not going to be the same this year. There's going to be more freedom. And I know that uh, both tours, I uh, think from recall, uh, the ATP is somewhere around 65%. Uh, the ATP a little lower than that. They both want to get it up to 80, 85 before all the players start to jet down under in uh, in late December. And that will make life just a hell of a lot easier. So that, that's the messaging that's been put across. But I mean, look, they're tennis players. Uh, they're not... Um, uh, they're not medical experts. Uh, some would say they're a little uh, naive, the tennis players. are in this cocoon of a lifestyle they live and uh, maybe not the brightest sparks all the time. But uh, this would just help their cause if they got all this done because their their job is to travel the world uh, earning their income. So, yeah, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Absolutely. And I suppose you could conversely say, well, yes, they are professional athletes. They're also not in the, uh, the category of 80 plus and obese. So... You know, it's a very layered issue once again yeah. as to whether they're even at risk. But as you mentioned, they're traveling all around the place. Safety first is probably the approach to take there. Brett, very layered issue once again. Thank you so much for your time for Game On. Pleasure. Thank you. There could be no Roger Federer, no Novak Djokovic, and even no Rafael Nadal. So we will wait and see what plays out in that space. Let's now take a look at what is happening in the world of the beautiful game, though, with Adam Santarossa on Calcine TV. Adam, great to have you here. Let's start with the biggest news in the world of football. FIFA is ramping up their plans for a biennial World Cup. It's a move that's been slammed by many people and experts and former players. What's your take on it? Yeah, I join that. I, uh, I slam it as well. I think it's uh, a pretty silly idea. I think, you know, the beauty of it is it is every four years and, and it's, you know, diluting it and, and really, you know, I've read stuff today calling it the golden goose and that really is what it is uh, in the world of football. It's it's the pinnacle of, of football and, 
you know, particularly you look at it in the Australian context, you know, the money that that generates is really the lifeblood of the game. Uh, here in Australia, the FFA do make a lot of money from our participation in the World Cup. So, um, you know, every two years is probably going to dilute that. And I think it's definitely going to dilute the prestige and, and probably the interest level from, from a casual football fan. So uh, FIFA love to ruin a good thing. Uh, and it looks like they're going down the path of, of doing that here. I'm, I'm certainly not on board with this at all. Well, it's interesting you mentioned there about uh, interest rates in terms of people still wanting to follow the game and and they're gauging their level of interest because that's exactly what FIFA president Gianni Infantino has been saying. He's suggesting that it's all about keeping youngsters engaged and interested in the sport. So uh, is he just absolutely shooting into the wind with a comment like that? Does it have any semblance of reality of the situation? Yeah, look, realistically, when I first heard, like FIFA have been talking about this plan for quite some time now. When I first heard about it, I mean, they're going to need to get the confederations on side and, and each confederation has, you know, their own uh, revenue stream that is the, the European Championships of Copa America and, and even the subsequent qualifiers for that and, and the friendlies that now take place around the world throughout the year. So the, the UEFA Nations League, which is a new concept that UEFA introduced a couple of years ago. I mean, it all makes money. It's all revenue in terms of broadcast dollars coming in for those games. And Infantano's plan actually reduces the amount of international fixtures that would be played. So World Cup qualifiers would be decided in seven match days. So his argument is it's actually more beneficial for clubs because their players won't be away on international duty as much as they are now. But I don't know how you're deciding qualification for a World Cup. I know it's every two years, but in seven games uh, in, in the space of a year. So. Again, it's less games for the confederations and they're the ones that ultimately will have to be behind this move and I can't see them agreeing to that. Yeah, it could be a very interesting few months, that's for sure, as negotiations continue. Let's shift our attention now to the EPL and there's big news there as well. Struggling Newcastle deciding to part ways with their manager, Steve Bruce. Yeah, made the move, which, uh, you know, was fairly expected once the takeover happened. Uh, you know, we expect Newcastle to be fairly prominent in the January transfer window and, and the newly acquired billions of dollars uh, going to, I guess, every player uh, under the sun. Like we've seen Manchester City and Paris Saint-Germain do when, when they were taken over. Uh, and I guess they, they want that high profile manager, which they deem Steve Bruce uh, not to be. And, and you know, he, he came out today and he was quite outspoken in terms of you know, he felt his job was, was a poison chalice. As soon as he had it, he never really felt comfortable and, and that he was ever assured, you know, a long-term stay in the role. And then the, in the transition to the new owners, he, he sort of saw it coming, I guess you could say. But they, they did allow him to see out his 1,000th game uh, as a manager on the weekend, which I thought was was a nice touch. But, yeah, he, he was pretty outspoken in terms of... Uh, and when you look at his record with Newcastle in, in his most recent stint, uh, 12th and 13th, and as he said, quite clear, 10 points and 12 points clear of the relegation zone. So it wasn't like they were battling. They are in a bit of a relegation battle this season, but um, you expect with that money in January uh, being spent, that'll, that'll turn things around. But I guess the, the, the warning for Newcastle United's new owners and their fans is that changing a manager, bringing a high-profile manager in doesn't guarantee success. The billions of dollars doesn't guarantee success. You look at Man United's struggles in recent years, Jose Mourinho, Louis van Gaal, the, the, the best cases and, and the money they've spent in recent years, it hasn't guaranteed success. So uh, there's there's a few names being thrown around. Paolo Fonseca has been linked to former Shakhtar Donetsk and, and Roma manager. Frank Lampard's been linked to the role. Wayne Rooney's been linked to the role. It's really that silly season where if your manager's not putting your name in the hat, uh, it's probably time for a new manager. So yeah, watch this space, but yeah, word of warning. It, it's not, it's not going to be a new name doesn't guarantee any different results. Well, still within the EPL, now there are a few rumours beginning to circulate about a bit of an unhappy camp at Man United, and most of it seems to centre around Cristiano Ronaldo. What do you know about this? Yeah, there was a report during the week, uh, I know we spoke the last two, two times I was on about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who's uh, still in the gun, under the gun in terms of retaining the manager job with Manchester United, and there was a report that came out uh, this week that they've sounded out Ronaldo on his thoughts on Ole in the manager's role, and, and there was uh, some talk that he gave a recommendation to approach Zinedine Zidane, who was his manager at Real Madrid, and, and probably the most high-profile manager who is not working at the moment. So uh, it, it'd be very interesting to see what what happens here. And, and look, Ole hasn't done himself any favours in terms of they went down to Leicester last weekend in the Premier League, and it was Ronaldo that saved their bacon this morning in, in the Champions League. They trailed 2-0 
to Atalanta at half time and then uh, Ronaldo's winner in the 81st minute got them home three goals to two but the story is still it was still an underwhelming performance it wasn't the Man United that we should be seeing given the talent they've got at their disposal so uh, yeah Solskjaer not out of the woods by any stretch and it's a big game on Monday they take on Liverpool they're big rivals and this could be the game that makes or breaks the, the Solskjaer reign I think. Absolutely. I mean, Mohamed Salah taking on Cristiano Ronaldo in a battle of the Fords. And also, I mean, you mentioned there they haven't been playing, uh, playing particularly well. A lot of that seems to have criticism surrounding, you know, it's a team full of excellent players that don't really seem to perform cohesively as a team together, whether it be Varane at the back or Ronaldo up the front. They've got these players, but it just doesn't seem to be gelling, which I guess, of course, as you mentioned, comes back onto Solskjaer. Just lastly, to wrap things up, we're out and about moving a bit more again. There's more freedoms coming to Sydney siders. Of course, uh, now Victoria is also coming out of lockdown. We could finally get back to seeing some football live in the flesh. And for Sydney siders, there's a good opportunity to do that this week. Yeah, two games in the, in the coming days. The Matildas take on Brazil, which is really the, the kickoff of the next cycle uh, for them towards the World Cup here in Australia. Uh, in 2023 so uh fourth place in the olympics which you know to be super critical they probably could have done a little bit better uh losing to, to sweden and the usa in, in those games and uh they've actually lost their last three games so there's a little bit of pressure for them on tony gustafson to to i guess start this new cycle on a positive note and he is turning to some new faces uh in terms of doing that remy simpson's been called in who uh, w League fans, we know her, and, and she's done a great job with Sydney FC in recent seasons. So he's looking at that World Cup cycle and, and you know, what the Matildas are going to look like in the next two years. So he's giving some opportunities to some young players. So it'll be fascinating to see how they respond. Brazil, always difficult, but uh, a big crowd expected out there uh, at now Combank Stadium, uh, the Combank Matildas. So uh, really the darlings of, of Australian football at the moment, as they should be. Now, will you be there in the stands waving the uh, the Socceroos and Matildas flags, every single piece of gear that you have that's Aussie related? Unfortunately not uh, this weekend, but I will be sitting on the couch, maybe donning the uh, Australian gear this weekend. But yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see how they go. They had some critics with the way they played and they were a little bit fortunate, I felt, to, to get to fourth at the, at the Olympics. But uh, yeah, very intriguing to see what they, what they put up here against Brazil. Wonderful. Adam, you're always across every part of the beautiful game. Thank you so much for joining Game On. Pleasure. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calcine TV. Now, if you are interested, those Matildas matches are happening on October 23 and October 26, and tickets are still available. All right, time now for a very short break before we wrap up with sports business. Welcome back to Calkine TV. I'm James Preston, and this is Game On, your home for sports news and opinion. And it's now time to turn our attention to the finances off the field with sports business. Well, it's another week and another example of the evolving love affair of sport and crypto. The National Basketball Association, better known as the NBA, has teamed up with crypto exchange Coinbase on a multi-year partnership. The deal also extends to the WNBA, NBA G League, NBA 2K League and the USA Basketball Outfit. Coinbase released a statement that explained that as part of the partnership, we will create interactive experiences to engage with the NBA and WNBA's incredible community and athletes around the world. Whilst further details of the partnership have not yet been released, the partnership comes just a week after Coinbase announced the release of its own NFT marketplace. 
Naturally, that lends itself to the belief that the deal will incorporate creating unique fan tokens, e-trading cards and other NFT products. The NBA and Coinbase deal is reminiscent of the Major League Baseball's deal with crypto exchange FTX, which went live back in July. Australia's football broadcasting war has well and truly begun to heat up, having already secured the A-League rights in conjunction with new streaming giant partner Paramount+. Plus. The duo has now also secured the rights to the Emirates FA Cup. The FA Cup is the world's longest running domestic knockout football competition and is open to all 92 professional clubs from the Premier League, Championship and Leagues 1 and 2, along with several hundred clubs in the National League system between Tiers 5 and 10. The new deal will bring live and on-demand coverage for the complete competition, which is set to feature EPL superstars such as Cristiano Ronaldo, N'Golo Conte and also Mohamed Salah. The coverage will include the first round proper on the 6th of November all the way to the final at Wembley Stadium in May 2022. Network 10 and Paramount Plus is also in the hunt for Australia's English Premier League rights. Optus is the current rights holder in a deal that expires in 2022. The Premier League has launched the media rights for the upcoming cycle of 2022-23 to 24-25 for Australia last weekend. The deadline to bid for the first round is set for November 15. Bidders will have the option to tender for a three-year cycle or a six-year cycle, with the six-year cycle featuring a loyalty rate that will see the cost of the deal reduced toward the back end of the agreement. Most European agreements to date have opted for the six-year option, it's believed Optus is keen to continue its relationship with the EPL but will face stiff competition from Network 10 and Paramount Plus and also the Nine Network is expected to push hard for the rights with a view to placing much of the content on their Stan Sports streaming platform. Foxtel, the former home of the A-League, BN Sports and Amazon are all not expected to contest for the rights. Well that's all for this edition of Game On. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'll catch you next Friday. Until then, get out there and go and kick something. Preferably a ball.